for all of us. It's about predicting where the consumer is going and getting half of it right. One of the things we want to do is create ads that don't suck. Embracing change creates great possibility. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. Today on the show, I've got Mark Barden, who's partner at a firm called Eat Big Fish. Eat Big Fish coined the term challenger brand in their original book, Eating the Big Fish. Today on the show, we're going to talk a lot about the difference between being a disruptor and being a challenger brand and the spectrum on which those things exist and lots and lots of examples. For anyone that's looking to either try to disrupt or challenge category incumbents, this is the episode for you. We're going to lay out how to do it, how Mark is counseling companies, and we're going to spend a lot of time talking about an upcoming chapter that he authored that's going to be in a book released in August of this year. And the book is called Eat Your Greens from the Account Planning Group, a UK-based organization, association. Enjoy this show with Mark Barton from Eat Big Fish. Well, Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you, Alan. Thanks for having me. Let's just get into it. You sent me a chapter to read, and I want to know, are you trying to fight the almighty Byron Sharp and the proven facts on how brands grow with this nonsense that you're talking about on challenger brands? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I see. So this is how it's going to be, is it? Okay. No, I don't have the stones to take on Prof Sharp. And I'm actually a huge fan of that body of work of the Ehrenberg Bass Institute. And I, I know that you know that because it's in the chapter. But there are a couple of specific things that I think are different about how we think about challenger brands than is reflected in that work. And we'll, we'll get into that today, if you like. But no, we're huge, huge fans. I mean, what I have found that to be really useful for the whole of the Ehrenberg Bass Institute body of work. And I primarily studied the first book, not the, I know they've got another one out now, but just this very simple idea that if you, how brands grow, there's two things, physical availability and mental availability. And and the clarifying nature of being able to talk to my clients about those two concepts and how challenger brand thinking feeds into primarily creating mental availability and building memory structures. It's just very you know, simple, clarifying, and it gets, it allows us to clear away a lot of the kind of chatter and nonsense and gobbledygook of modern marketing that, you know, often invades conversations about brand building today. So I found it to be refreshing and in some ways, a kind of back to basics mentality. What do you think? No, I agree. I agree. I wouldn't call myself a a Sharponian, but... (laughs) But I definitely subscribe to the simplicity and the thinking and the research that's gone behind it. But I I do think to you, I I think you highlight in this chapter, and we're going to get into it, there are some components missing or or some augmentations, adaptations or additives that need to be added to the, the laws as Byron would call them. Yeah. So next question I have is really around, like, when did you get into this challenger business and where did it start? And how long have you been on this journey for challenger brands? Yeah. So Adam Morgan, who is the founder of Eat Big Fish, wrote a book called Eating the Big Fish in 1999. And I'd known Adam from when we were both young planners in London. He came out to work at Shiat Day in LA in the late 90s, mid late 90s. I was at Wyden and Kennedy then and, and later Al Ryan and Partners. And so we got to know each other as West Coast heads of planning a little bit better. He was working, when he was at Shire Day, he was working on this notion of challenger brand, which was, a, I think, the first time that phrase had been coined by an account exec at Shire. And Adam got really interested in it, and they wanted to build that out as the kind of positioning for the agency. And so he started doing a body of work that is still ongoing. We call it the Challenger Project. It's the study of challenger brands all around the world to figure out how to use it to be Shire Day's positioning. And he got a leave of absence, went off, wrote a book, came back in the interim, <laughs> they had been bought by TBWA. And they said, no, we have this idea of disruption. It's very similar to challenger brands. And that's one of the things we'll get into in a moment. But Adam was kind of, I've just written this book on challenger brands. I'm kind of interested in it. You know, a lot of stuff happened, but eventually he started a business and he called me and said, look, I'm going back to the UK to start this business called Eat Big Fish, driven by these insights in this body of work I've got. And the book, Eating the Big Fish, I'm going to publish. Would you like to be the US-based arm of that? And it just happened to come at the right time. And that was the beginning of it. I did take a slight leave of absence to go, actually, our first client together 
this is the kind of awful human being that I am. <laughs> so Adam and I worked on a project together and it was a, a dot-com startup in the days of dot-com. It's a classic challenger. And I just fell in love with the mission and, the, and some of the people that ran that business and ended up going off to work there as the head of marketing, 1999 to 2002. Classic dot-com flame out. I'll tell you more about that if you're interested. But anyway, <laughs> that's how I got into challenges. So Adam's work, studying it with him and then being a practitioner for a while and realizing just how useful the tool and technologies that he's developed and we've subsequently built upon in the last couple of decades actually of doing this work together along with a bunch of other people based in London and New York. That's the foundation of Eat Big Fish and the Challenger Project. Nice. We talked to, alluded to this chapter that you've written. Tell me the book that it's going to be in. Tell the audience what the book it's going to be. Yeah. So it's, I wrote a, a paper, a white paper, where I was exploring the differences between disruption and challenger brands. And I put it on LinkedIn. It got the attention of a couple of guys Let's see, Weimer's last name, Schneider and Shambiglione. And they challenged me on it, actually. They kind of came out with, with a critique of it. And I learned a lot about how to make the paper better. And then it turned into, would you like it to be a chapter in a book called Eat Your Greens, which is the 50th anniversary publication of an August group based out of the UK called the Account Planning Group, which is a, an organization that formed around the, the birth of account planning in the UK. And this is their 50th anniversary book, and it's got 35 contributions in it. And our chapter is called Why Challenger Brands Matter in the Age of Disruption. So that's what it's about. That's great. Well, I want to tackle some questions that I think the chapter addresses. And I found myself misusing challenger brands in the past reference to them myself. So can you help you know, distinguish, as you do in the article, between classic disruptors and what challenger brands are? Yes, I can. So I want to frame it slightly larger than that. So because there's classic disruption theory, which is the work of Clayton Christensen, Professor Clayton Christensen from Harvard Business School. And that was, he put forward a bunch of ideas in a book called The Innovator's Dilemma in 1997, which became kind of legend in Silicon Valley. Apparently Steve Jobs was a big fan. Jeff Bezos was a big fan. And that had very specific definition of what it meant to be a disruptor. And I'll go into that in a moment. It subsequently entered uh, common parlance, as I'm sure you're only too aware. It's like every time you open a, a marketing article, it's talking about disruption. And so I felt a certain kinship with that because Adam, when he defined what a challenger brand was in Eating the Big Fish, also had a quite specific set of definitions that he wanted to use. And we've subsequently also lost control of the narrative to some degree. And everybody talks about themselves as a challenger brand now, even by definition of their state in the marketplace. So if you're not the brand leader, you must, by definition, they say, be a challenger brand. Actually, it's much more nuanced and complex in our world. But we too lost control of that narrative and everybody's using it challenge or a challenge brand. <laughs> and so that was really the impetus for digging into this. So I want you to imagine in front of you, you've got a spectrum, so a straight line on a piece of paper. And on the left-hand side of that spectrum is business model disruption. And that's where classic disruption theory begins and ends. And then all the way over to the other side of that page, you've got marketing model disruption. And that's really where challenger brands begin, which is about breaking marketing conventions. But in the middle, you've got sort of along that spectrum from classic disruption theory, which, which I'll define in a moment, you've got kind of more classical disruptive thinking, Google, moonshot type work, Tesla, I think this is where Uber fits. And then a little bit further along that spectrum, you've got uh, category reinvention. And we might there look at brands like Vice Media and what they've done in the world of news and media and their version of how they do think about the news. They call it immersionism. And then all the way over to the other, the right hand side is where you get these classic challenger brands like Brewdog and Axe, the original Axe, Benefit Cosmetics, you name it. There's a bunch of different brands there and we'll talk about them in a moment. So let's start with classic disruption theory. Yeah. This is, you know, forgive me, I'm going to get a bit nerdy here, but um, <laughs> that's okay. Yeah, well, it was really important to me to go to understand the roots of this and where it came from because, you know, we're often in conversation with clients, as I'm sure a lot of the people who listen to your podcast, they're either clients who want to understand how to disrupt or they're consultants and agency partners like us that need to advise clients on how to think about disruption. And understanding the various dimensions of it is important. So, classic disruption theory as defined by Christensen, is coming into a category with a lower cost and often inferior product and using that to establish a toehold because nobody else wants to compete there. He speaks in his book about imported 
low quality, low cost steel from Asia and how that disrupted the American steel market. But a probably easier example for us all to get our heads around is Toyota. So Toyota in 1960s comes to the US, it's really, really poor quality cars, but really cheap. They're serving an underserved market as people who can't afford to get into an American made car at that time. And they establish a toehold and mostly Detroit ignores it because they're like, well, it's rubbish. That's never going to get you in rubbish cars. But Toyota uses that foothold to establish a capability of building cars cheaper because they have to, they have to hit certain price points. And so they develop a production model, they can have a cost advantage off, and then they slowly but surely start to migrate up the value chain. And we end up today with, you know, the Toyota Camry, the most ex- hottest selling car in America for many years in a row. And ultimately, of course, Lexus, they get all the way to the very top of the luxury market, having disrupted, having come in and built this platform, ever better cars, the Toyota production system, now legend, that's classic disruption theory. A modern day equivalent of that might be Google AdWords. So if you think about what that looked like, I mean, you know, a very, you and I could have bought an ad for our consultancies for a dollar on Google. It's not going to look very good, but you can buy a keyword. (laughs) It's not the same as high quality, high production display advertising. And yet it brought lots of people who weren't being served by the advertising model at the time into the market, established Google. And, you know, we now know where Google has gone with YouTube and where it may end up going, I suppose, doing um, more and more disruption in, in the world of advertising. So that's classic disruption theory. And a lot of what passes as, as disruption and is described as disruption in the media and in the chatter, brands like Tesla and Uber, according to classic disruption theory, don't fit, which is not that interesting, I suppose, if you're you and I, but it's just interesting to me. I heard there was um, there's a great podcast that I love called A16Z, which is the podcast of Andreessen Horowitz, which is um, yeah, legendary Silicon Valley venture firm. And they were interviewing one of uh, Christensen's acolytes from Harvard Business School. And he got quite upset that the interviewer <laughs> wanted to keep calling Uber a disruptor. He's like, no, 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 not a disruptor. And you know, his argument is it's not cheaper than taxis. And actually, all they've done is switch taxi users over to something else. So by classic disruption theory, it doesn't work. Now, it's significantly better than, I think we'd all agree, unless you're perhaps an Uber driver, we'd all agree that it's better in terms of the customer experience. <laughs> And it's a, you know, arguably a 10x disruption, which is what Silicon Valley strives for and what's often described as disruption in, in the media down there and in the conversations down there. So Google moonshots, for example, each of which is a, you know, this is the idea that Larry Page talks about often with 10x inventions, you know, floating balloons across the Sahara Desert to provide internet access for people it is in and of itself not classic disruption theory. It's a very disruptive idea of how to bring internet to the world. So that would be further along our spectrum. Interesting. And so when you think about a true challenger brand, like let's say Axe as an example, why, what makes them a challenger brand, I guess? Well, I think you think about the history of Axe was prior to, I mean, I'm talking about the sort of, I know Axe has moved again recently with its kind of its point of view about what modern masculinity is. But in the days when it was guy gets girl, they were coming in a, they had a strong point of view, a challenger point of view. I think prior to, Axe, if you go back all the way through history was, you know, Unilever brand that was driven, they were trying to present a functional claim about deodorant and not being sweaty during the day. And they missed the obvious thing, which was that guys want to smell good in order to get the girl. And so they built a very strong, what we call in our parlance, a lighthouse identity. So it's a belief-driven point of view. Young men want to get laid. This is the secret way you do that. You break all the conventions that existed at the time around male deodorant smelling good, which was, you know, about performance and rational benefits. And they just went straight after. And that, you know, in essence is a challenge of brand piece of provocation, breaking category conventions, driven by a belief system, being quite provocative, and consequently becoming famous and creating the kind of mental availability that Byron Sharp talks about, which is where I think challenger brands and uh, the Ehrenberg Bass Institute start to align around what is it that it requires that brands require to be successful building this mental availability. How do challenger brands do it? They do it by breaking conventions, having strong points of view, aiming for fame, being provocative as a way of breaking through and creating 
the kind of salience that they need to reach all these light users that Byron Sharp so fond of. I appreciate you clarifying all these concepts because I'm going to stop calling Uber a disruptor and they're really just a 10x play. We'll, we'll be the only people in the world that do that. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Apart from know. the guys at Christmas. Well, I just wonder how many VCs or how many uh, startups out there have been the Uber of blank and have raised millions on this notion that Uber's a disruptor. So it's I can understand the Clayton Christensen and his acolytes getting upset. <laughs> well, there's a little sort of parable in this paper here about all the, do you remember all the laundry startups? And they were all coming out, so the Uber of laundry. And there were, it seemed like dozens of them, and they're all raising quite a lot of money. And because their business models are infinitely copyable, you can, anybody could enter into that category and pick up laundry and drop it off and so on. There's no real disruption theory thinking baked into the business model. And therefore, those companies are vulnerable unless they move to the other side of that spectrum and think about marketing model disruption and start to try to build brands that are distinctive, that have a unique point of view, that are breaking the conventions, whatever they are, of the laundry business to signal we're different, we're interesting, we're novel. And then they embed themselves in people's memory structures and they have a possibility at least of owning some of that mental real estate that is going to create stickiness and going to create usage and loyalty, quote unquote, because I know Byron doesn't like that idea inertia, but they establish themselves as getting a, a toehold in your mind, if you like, and that creates inertia that allows them to build some stickiness. So maybe if some of these laundry brands have built disruptive challenger brands, even if they didn't have the disruptive business model to go with it, they would stand a chance. But without it, they're hosed. You brought Byron back in. Let's talk about Byron because one of the gaps I feel like, and I asked him this on the podcast I did with him and we'll link to that as well, but I didn't get the group best answer is small budget brands, if you will, because because his notion is you should just go as wide as possible, right? To create the most uh, reach and awareness of your brand that you can possibly muster. But obviously that's not available to every brand or not at the scale that we would like it to be to actually take on the incumbents. You seem to lay out in the chapter and in the work around challenger brands, I think a very logical sequence of you just talked about, you know, identifying your ideology, building a distinctive brand, converting that into a fan base that ultimately helps you get brand fame. And then the result is growing a growth in profits. So can you help just kind of explain that sequence, if you will? And I may ask you a follow-up question on fame because that concept really intrigued me when I was reading that paper. Yeah, great. Yeah, please do, because I'd like to give credit to the people who gave us that concept. So, yeah, I mean, let's take a, a real, for instance, BrewDog. Um, do you, are you familiar with BrewDog? I am not, no. Okay, no, I mean, it's it's in the UK, it's very famous consumer packaged goods brand. I think they were the fastest growing consumer packaged goods brand two or three years in a row in recent history. So it's a it's interesting. It's a it's a brewery based out of northern Scotland somewhere. So it couldn't be <laughs> on the edge of the world. Who are brewing American style craft beers, which is interesting in the UK. And there's two guys that are just really seething about the quality of beers that are available to them in the UK. You know, I mean, if you think about the history of Britain, it's a history of beer, if nothing else. And, you know, we've become like everybody else overrun by what they describe as bland, insipid, monolithic, tasteless, <laughs> apathetic beers. This is, that was my James Watt impersonation. I, I, I heard the Scottish accent come <laughs> And, you know, they're just incensed by it. So they create, they start brewing great beers. I mean, they're very, very small. They started it with a $30,000 bank loan. Their business started doing quite well because they were making these interesting, distinctive beers, tiny, tiny base up in the north of Scotland. Then the financial crisis hit in the UK. So they couldn't borrow any money to fund their expansion. And so they you know, did what a lot of good entrepreneurs do, which is they borrow money from their customers. We now call it crowdsourcing, but they did a major crowdsourcing initiative called Equity for Punks. I think they've now done four of them. They've broken the world record for crowdfunding and they have something like 45,000 investor fans now who clearly are fully vested in that business because they own a piece of it. They've owned a piece of it because they love the beers and they want to see this brand succeed. And so as a consequence, they advocate like maniacs for this company. And so, you know, which comes first, the fame or the fans, we can debate. But I think certainly what Brewdog did to get the notoriety and attention in the early days of the brand is 
worth talking about just a little bit more. So they did some kind of bonkers stuff where, so they've got a marketing budget of zero, which is still, you know, the vast majority of businesses in the world have a marketing budget of zero. So it's interesting, what does the Ehrenberg Bass Institute's advice to those people? I mean, it still works in the sense that those companies have to create salience somehow. But what the guys at BrewDog did was they did a bunch of essentially PR stunts. So they brewed the strongest beer in the world. I think it was called Tactical Nuclear Penguin. <laughs> It drinks more like a scotch than a beer. They created a beer when the Olympics were in London in 2012. They created a beer called Nevermind the Anabolics, <laughs> which had banned substances that we were going to be talking about in the media in the beer. And they're doing these outrageous publicity stunts to get their point across about the kind of beers that they want to make. Interesting, characterful beers, stronger in alcohol, novel taste profiles to wake up the world, wake up the UK to pay attention to what it is that is their mission, which is to rid the world of these bland, tasteless, monolithic, apathetic beers. And so they get huge spikes on every time they came out with a really strong beer or really, you know, a beer with banned substances, they're getting a ton of media coverage. So they're using their product as a way to generate tons of free marketing and it creates its own fans and they bring into these new fans into the company by making them co-owners of the business and the thing starts to gain momentum. So you pointed out, I think you said a logical sequence here is ideology. So they've got one. They know what they stand for. They know what they stand against. They build a really distinctive brand, not per se a differentiated brand, although I guess we could argue that a lot of these American style craft beers are quite differentiated in the UK or were, not so much anymore. They make themselves famous. That brings in a bunch of fans who they try to create co-ownership with, and that leads to growth. And they're about to come to the US. They've actually built a brewery now. I think their current valuation is something close to a half a billion dollars in less than a decade. And they got there with zero marketing budget by creating fame. So to answer your second question, where does this concept come from? So we borrowed it from a couple of researchers in the UK, Les Binet and Peter Field. Peter Field used to work at Eat Big Fish, so we quite tight with him. And, and Les and Peter got access to the um, IPA, the Institute of Practitioners in Advertising Database. Yep. You're familiar with this body I, of work? Yeah. Well, the IPA in particular. but yeah. yeah. So they did a meta-analysis. So the IPA is like, it's the best of the best case studies. And I think there's like 20,000 now, primarily UK, Europe, but they've North America, Australia is in, in that database now. And they looked at what was it that drives communications effectiveness and impact. And they, you know, their study reveals that, of course, what you and I would like to think as marketers have known all along, which is emotion trumps rational reason. So if you put rationality into your advertising, you can convince somebody, but you're not going to move them to action. If you put reason and emotion in there, you're going to do quite well, better than just reason alone. But if you aim for fame, which they define as surprising, dramatic ideas in your marketing, and if you make that the objective, the goal of your brand is to create fame, that works more than anything else in terms of their analysis of the IPA database. And so for the challenger, and this is the advice we give to a lot of our clients, you need to begin with fame in mind. What is it that we are going to do that is going to embed this brand, put this brand into popular culture? You know, we, people use the term going viral these days or used to perhaps. I'm sure there's some more modern nomenclature for that. But that's essentially the idea. If you're a challenger brand, you have to figure out how to create the kind of salience that Ehrenberg Bass Institute is so with, uh, fond of with zero money. And it's a very big ask. But if you don't have the money and you're trying to change people's behavior and get them to stop buying that beer and start buying this beer, you have to be quite deliberate and quite provocative and aim for fame. Love it. Thank you for the definition of fame too. I mean, kind of drilling one more level on fame. It sounds like forget all rational thinking, just go fully on surprise, dramatic, emotional intention. Yeah. I, well, that might be overstating a little bit. Okay. I think I've done enough work in the auto business that you often will hear, and this is the classic case, I think you'll often hear of people who spent too much money on a BMW justifying that purchase with all kinds of <laughs> rational reasons. Yes. And that is a, an entirely valid role for a reason in marketing, to give people something to tell their neighbor about why they overpaid. But to begin with fame in mind is still 
the most important idea. Again, particularly if you're a challenger, you don't have much money and you've got to, you know, challengers have to introduce something into the conversation in a category that changes the way the category works. So if you're just basing your marketing on historical best practices, which if you look at what most big company marketing looks like, you look at, you know, modern day hotel chains, modern day supermarkets, most domestic beer marketing, it's driven by a set of conventional wisdom and best practice that is there for good reason, because they've been historically proven by the data to work. But the challenger can't just come along and play the same rule book because that just plays into the hands of the big fish. And as Byron says, and Peter and, and Les Binet's work shows, you need to create a new criteria of choice to shift people towards your brand and break that in a cycle of inertia. So best practice, great if you're a big brand leader, lousy if you're a challenger brand, start with fame. Interesting. Interesting. You know, this logical process that we just talked through, it starts with ideology. And I feel like I would be remiss if I didn't like, for Byron's sake, say, you know, he would call bullshit on that, right? Or horse shit, or I don't know what the equivalent in Australia is, maybe kangaroo shit. I don't know <laughs> what they use. Maybe it's still bullshit. I don't know. But, you know, but why? Because it sounds a little like purpose, but I think it's more than that. But I would love for you to say, you know, why is ideology important? Yeah, and it is a lot like purpose. And like you and many other commentators, Richard Shotton, for example, who writes a chapter in this book, Eat Your Greens, is very down on, on purpose because it's become, you know, it's become another kind of fashionable thing to talk about. So what I'm interested in is, so there's two sides to the purpose debate, right? There's the kind of, you're developing a purpose for a brand. In the case of BrewDog and many of our clients, they are single brand companies. What you're sitting down talking to those people about at the beginning, whether you're a startup or whether you're a challenger brand initially that's lost your way and you're 20, 30 years into your journey and you need to remind yourself of your challenger credentials, what you're trying to do is get a group of people really passionately committed and engaged by the mission that they are on as a group of people. Because it's really kin hard being a challenger brand. You're up against it every single day. You're up against the skepticism of the media, the reluctance of the retailer to stock you and not the, the inertia, the sort of autopilot that the modern consumer is on. It's really hard to persist, to be creative in the face of that, and to just go after it day in, day out. And so you need a very strong sense of commitment to something as a group of people. I'm a big fan of Daniel Pink's book, Drive, yeah. where he talks about, you know, what are the three things that motivate human beings? It's autonomy, mastery, and purpose. I need the freedom to do what I want to do, autonomy. I need to be really good at this, mastery, and I need purpose. I need a sense of I'm contributing to something bigger than myself. Those are as fundamental and as proven by the data as anything that Ehrenberg Bass has to say, but it's on the inside. It's the inside story. So what we do, the work that we do with clients when we're working to develop challenger brand strategies, we start with that. What's the ideology? What's the belief system? What is it you passionately believe in and you're prepared to go to the mat for? Let's build a brand around that. Yes, let's obey the laws of modern marketing and how brands grow by saying, let's build memory structures for that. Mm -hmm. Let's create iconography. Let's create sound bites. Let's create language that captures the spirit of your belief system so that it shows up in your modern marketing. But it's, you know, modern marketing for challenger brands is the brand story is a manifestation of the belief system of that business. You, that doesn't mean you kind of lead with purpose. And, you know, I, I think you and I talked a couple of weeks back, didn't we, about the snarky tweet I'd just seen <laughs> yes. the, where somebody said, I was in Best Buy this weekend and I couldn't figure out whether to buy the Sony or the Toshiba because I couldn't remember what the purpose statement <laughs> of Toshiba was. Right. Well, that's bullshit. That's not the way it works. It was never intended to work that way way. And it really pisses me off when I hear people dismiss everything that's good about purpose with that as their kind of uh, piece of evidence. Because what I know from working with challenges and, and interviewing challenges as part of the ongoing study into challenger brands, when you talk to founders, it's all about animating a, a group of people to do their best work. And that comes down to being clear on what your ideology is, what problems you're trying to fix, what things you're trying to write, what wrongs you're trying to write in the world on behalf of 
the consumer, the beer drinking public, the cell phone using public, the burger eating public. You're trying to right wrongs on their behalf and getting clear on that is really powerful. And that's what the ideology does. And it fuels the relentlessness that you need as a challenger. I love that. You're absolutely right. I've, I think I'm on my ninth business starting a business on the founding team. Uh, there's no fame and glory in the early days. All you have is your purpose. <laughs> yes. Why are we still here? Because there's no money coming in the door. So, And all those guys who work at the big brand competitor of yours have got free tickets to the Oscars and they're at the Super Bowl and you're in the trenches on Super Bowl Sunday trying to sell more product. Oh yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, so I want to pivot a little bit and get back to the spectrum that you talked about that you know, on the left hand, if you will, the classic disruption theory, on the right hand, all the way to the other side, the marketing model disruption, where probably more traditional challengers live. But you highlight two, what you call full spectrum business examples, one Southwest and the other is Warby Parker. And I wondered if you could discuss the full spectrum, because it seems like to me that that's the potentially a very sustainable place to be, to be a so quote unquote full spectrum challenger, if you will. Yeah. I mean, I think it came from when you look at that spectrum and you see the options there, I think you can win, you can build a successful business by landing on any particular part of that spectrum. But what becomes impregnable, I mean, nothing's impregnable these days, but more, more likely to be impregnable than not is if you can squat on the whole map. So, you know, and the, the classic example of Southwest Airlines. So let's Let's unpack a little bit what it is that they did, right? So classic disruption theory in the sense that they said underserved markets. So we, we're not going to go to the major uh, hub markets. We're going to build an airline around these kind of second tier markets. So it's underserved people there and we're going to do it incredibly low cost by having one airplane. I mean, the original, there's a great story in, in our latest book, A Beautiful Constraint, which talks about how challenger brands are really good at harnessing constraints to promote and prompt innovative thinking. And there's a great story in there about one of the early executives at Southwest saying, we needed to figure out how to fly a three airplane route with just two planes. (laughs) So, you know, face value, it's not possible. But it led them to invent things like, you know, you sit where you want, just get on the plane and sit down, 30 minute turnarounds, no snacks on the plane. So, you know, we don't have to bother with that. We can keep the cost really low. There's less cleaning up to be done every time when we're trying to turn these planes around. And, you know, to finish that quote, she said, we did it because we didn't know it couldn't be done. And so, so what are they doing? They're taking people who used to be traveling on the bus and they're getting in them on planes, and they're doing it at a price point that can't be beaten by any of the competitors at the time, and they're serving these underserved markets. So classic disruption theory in terms of their business model. But you also had this guy, Herb Kelleher, who was the founder of Southwest, who was a, a bit of a nut job by all accounts, <laughs> right. if, if you read about him. I mean, there was there's a great story about, again, at the founding early days of Southwest, that there was another regional airline that wanted to have the name and they were going to go to court. You know, they'd got lawyers and they were lawyering up to go and take this thing to court. And Herb said, no, 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 let's settle this in a rather unconventional way. Let's settle this debate about who gets the name with a wrestling match. <laughs> so, I mean, literally a wrestling match. So he got his main competitor into the wrestling ring. They had a wrestling match. Herb won. He got the rights to the names. And of course, what he did there was create fame. Right. <laughs> who the hell is this nut job that's starting an airline called Southwest Airlines? Suddenly, everybody in that area that had got a lot of coverage knows the name. And then they bake into their culture this idea of positively outrageous service. So we have to make an impact and be different, distinctive, to use Byron's words, in the consumer service experience. So we're going to have, you know, flight attendants hiding in the overhead bins when people get in and jumping out and surprising people. And we're going to get flight attendants wrapping the safety announcement, which they all of which they've done. You can go and look at it on YouTube and so on. So they've covered the whole spectrum, got a distinctive disruptive business model. They've reinvented the category completely in terms of thinking about the conventions of how you market and talk about and do service, and they've embraced the full spectrum. So it makes Southwest a very difficult business to challenge and disrupt because they've got the whole thing covered. And a modern day equivalent of that is Warby Parker. So again, what did Warby Parker do? They enter the category with a very simple, limited number of frames, they're all quite cheap. They're priced, at, I think it's $95 originally, the price point, and they sell it just online. And, you know, if you're Bausch and Lam and you're the Luxottica that basically has a monopoly, had a monopoly up until Warby Parker in the world of eyewear, you're charging 
Forex there, you've got all kinds of variety of frames, so, but you're vulnerable to, you're missing this kind of underserved market, which is maybe students and kids who want to come in and wear glasses like fashion items. So they're prepared to pay 95 bucks for it. And they've migrated up the value chain now. So they're now doing bifocals. They've now got their own stores. They've expanded their range. They're, I think if they haven't done it already, are about to do eye tests online using technology. So they're just going to keep going, but it's not just about business model disruption. They've built a phenomenal brand. They've been really clever at creating an ideology. When you see the founders who themselves have become famous and icons of the brand, I think, and they put themselves out there on every single speaking platform they can get, it seems, in order to promote themselves and the culture that they're building and the brand that that manifests in. They've done some really wonderful, unconventional marketing. So again, when we, as part of the Challenger Project, we interviewed Neil Blumenthal, one of the founders of Warby, he told us that the biggest sales day in the history of Warby Parker was the day after they launched their annual report. And how many companies can actually say that? (laughs) Because annual reports tend to be these kind of turgid reads about financial data in there, but it had a lot of the color about the culture, the kinds of people they were, what times of day are best for buying, what kinds of people have been buying, what frames they look at. They just shared a lot of interesting, colorful information that doesn't conform to any classic Ehrenberg Bass type marketing strategy, but it was fun. It was widely shared on social media. It drove a lot of new people, liked users, if you like, or new users to Warby's website and it created the biggest day in their sales history. So I don't know how that quite fits into the Ehrenberg Bass model other than it's driving salience amongst like users, but it's it's an unconventional way to do it. And I think that's why I'm such a big fan of Warby Parker and see them as what we're describing here as a full spectrum challenger or disruptor from business model all the way through to marketing convention. Interesting. We just talked about two full spectrum challengers, if you will. Do you need to be a full spectrum to be successful at being a challenger brand? No, I think, you know, if you, it's interesting, I haven't thought about One of the classic challenger brands of the moment or recent history is T-Mobile. You know, it's interesting. I haven't thought about analyzing that business through this model on the fly like this, but I don't think it's a classic disruption theory model, but I do think it's a very powerful and successful challenger brand driven by a strong sense of trying to right the wrongs in the category. I mean, they call themselves the uncarrier for a reason. And John Ledger talks about the clueless cellular (laughs) industry that's been ripping off people for years. And he he and his team have systematically, through T-Mobile 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, 4.0, have taken on one pain point after the other and marketed that brilliantly and provocatively. We're using, you know, when you think about hot pink, as a memory structure building device, classic how brands grow type thinking, classic challenger brand thinking. So I don't think they've got the business model disruption, but they've got brand disruption in spades. Another favorite of mine at the moment is Tillamook. So the Tillamook County Creamery Association, based out of Tillamook, Oregon, is essentially a dairy farmer-owned cooperative. They have some product truth, I guess. They would say that they're the nature of how much it rains in Oregon and how beautiful the grass is up there for their cows. They make great dairy products, but they've branded a commodity driven by an ideology that their tagline is dairy done right. So they've got a point of view about what it means to do dairy right and therefore a strong implication that there is such a thing called dairy done wrong. That's things like craft singles cheese slices, which technically isn't cheese, it's (laughs) Dairy, processed dairy product or something. For everyone that's listening, you should look at the label. It says something like cheese food, which I've never heard. Right. A real cheese, right. cheese food. So um, what I love about Tillamook is it's a 109-year-old business and they really got their kind of challenger mojo together about six or seven years ago under the leadership of Patrick Kreitzer, there, the CEO, working with the his marketing team, John Ross, led by John Russell and the people at 72 and Sunny, to create this famous making story. And if you look at anybody's interest to go do some Googling on them blowing up 
uh, competitors' products in their ads and doing viral videos <laughs> about this kind of horrible plastic cheese stuff as a way of creating fame. It's not, you know, I don't know what their awareness numbers are, but amongst in the Pacific Northwest, they've got very high salience. And their challenge now is how to expand as they move eastwards in, into different parts of the US where they're not as well known. It'll be interesting to see how they continue to feed their challenger uh, brand positioning and continue to drive famous marketing that's going to help them to grow. So you don't have to be full spectrum. I think you can start anywhere on this map. There's still plenty of opportunity because of conventional marketing practice, best practice that, you know, if you pick up any textbook or read, you're tending to read about the practices of the brand leader as opposed to the challenger brand. And so anytime you see a convention, uh, you can go after it and disrupt it. And so long as there's something in it for the consumer, as a consequence of you disrupting that convention, you can find fans and you can start to generate fame. Got it. You've peppered us throughout this conversation so far with tips, I think. But do you have any advice you'd give other folks that are wanting to be a successful challenger? Yes. Okay. So I think we, we've probably covered most of these, but I would say the first thing is, you know, I'm a, just a huge believer in figuring out what the belief system of your business is. Who are you? What are you trying to achieve in the world? Getting absolutely crystal clear about that and making it a shared sense of purpose with your leadership team is job one. You can't proceed and succeed without that, I don't think. Second thing is to then ruthlessly cut away anything that's not supporting and feeding that belief system. There's all kinds of extraneous stuff that creeps into the project list. Be ruthless about getting rid of them and just doubling down on the two or three things that make a difference. Start with fame in mind. We've talked about that. You know, use drama and surprise. This is just a very simple checklist when you're evaluating new product ideas or new marketing initiatives. Does this have the opportunity to make us famous? Is it going to start a conversation? Are people going to want to share this? If the answer is no, You've really got to ask yourself, is it worth doing? Because you've got limited resources and, and it's not going to help build the salience that you need in, to create that kind of choice amongst the light users. I think then, you know, doubling back to the purpose thing is building a culture at your company that can support the creation and promotion of brave, bold, um, different ideas. You know, how many, I'm sure everybody who's listening to this would agree with the fact that the best ideas, the most provocative ideas that they've ever created never make it out of the building. There's such a strong bias towards stuff that looks familiar. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Isn't there? Yeah. It just is. And, you know, you never put it in front of a focus group because it will <laughs> fail. <laughs> and so this is, you know, the godsend for challenges. They don't have money half the time to afford to research their ideas and therefore they don't have to endure that problematic moment where, well, nobody really likes it. You know, there's right. a great story about the guy, Steve Grass, who created Sailor Jerry and uh, Hendrix Gin. And he said, you know, when he was doing uh, focus groups with Hendrix Gin and he put that little squat bottle out on the table and and the design for it. And people hated it. And it's like, there it is. That's why we're doing it. Because <laughs> there's a, a, a measure of energy there. We hate that. Great. Therefore, it's at least got a fighting chance of breaking through because people are going to say in public. And it's so antithetical to the way that most of us think. And it's a, it requires a very brave, very courageous set of teams. And so I think the most successful challenges, the ones that endure over time, are the ones that are able to create a culture inside the firm that is able to support and promote brave thinking like that and not just have it get crushed at the first hurdle. So I think that would be my sort of last point. And along with that is the ability to manage conflict and tension inside a team. Because, you know, doing coming up with brave, bold ideas like this, it's difficult and people aren't going to like it. And so as a leader, you're going to have to manage that tension quite well and figure out when it's productive and really serving the organization and when it's not. Mm. And that's just, you know, skill, maturity, experience that kind of goes with the territory. I think. That's great. That's great. Well, this has been a fantastic conversation. I want to pivot and I, like I do with everyone that comes on the show and kind of get to know you, Mark, the person. <laughs> I love asking this question. I hope you don't mind it. Is there an experience in your past that defines or makes up who you've become? <laughs> just one. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't have to be. Well, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in roots. That shows up in our work all the time. We always 
talk to companies about going back to your roots as a business when you were powerful and starting your challenge journey or going back to your roots as an individual and saying, where do you come from and how do those values shape you? I'm a product of Sheffield, England. It's steel working town, working class family. Everybody left school at the age of 15. So there's that kind of working class roots, I think, that makes me want to be around and helping underdogs because that's the family mm. biography, if you like. But then there's that coupled with moving to California. I've lived in California now since 95, 96. And California is the most, you know, I mean, it's cliched stuff to say, but it's, I mean, if you've ever lived here, you'll have experienced this kind of open-mindedness, you know, and I was talking to a friend about this recently. He was on his third startup, which has failed. It was a Christmas party. And he's like, you know, it's the only place I, in the world I know where I can show up at a holiday party and tell people I failed again <laughs> and then go, great, man, that's awesome. Uh, you know, and be really supportive because <laughs> they know that right. there is no path to glory that doesn't go through failure. And so I think that combination of Sheffield and San Francisco is probably as much responsible for shaping who I am and the kind of work that I get off on as anything. I love it. It may be a related question, but what fuels you or what drives you to get up and do what you do every day? Oh God, this is going to make me sound very California again. <laughs> but you know, I mean, and it's true. It's absolutely true. And I'll tell you as another anecdote. I was at a, a conference that a client of mine was hosting and I'd made a speech about Challenger Brands that day. And, and this woman came up to me at the bar and said, you know, who's your favorite client? And I said, you know, I think you have to fall in love with all of your clients to do your best work. And so whichever is the one I'm working on at the moment, that's my favorite client. The thing, you know, I am, oh, this is probably a slightly controversial thing to say, but I'll say it anyway, I'm, I'm losing interest in marketing as I grow old, I've been doing this for a long time. It's not that it's not a fascinating category. It's just I've been doing it for a long time. The bit that I don't get tired of is seeing people that I'm working with get it. When you see the light behind their eyes kind of flicker and they go, oh, that I can get behind. This is worth getting up at six in the morning to come to the office. You know, that is worthwhile work in the world. And it doesn't have to be profound work, social change work. It can be selling better beer. But when that's my job, I think, is to sit in rooms with people, work with people and activate that instinct in them, that desire in them. That's what keeps me coming back to do this kind of work. Nice. What are there brands, companies, causes you think other people should take notice of or that you follow? Yeah. Let me talk about three sure. Bay Area ones, just focusing on the San Francisco Bay again. And, you know, putting aside the classic sort of Silicon Valley, blah, blah, about disruption. There are actually some really, of course, fascinating businesses here. And they're, they're, I'll flag three and they're all quite different. The first is Impossible Foods. Are you familiar with the Impossible Burger? No, I, it sounds vaguely familiar, but I'm not sure. Right. So Pat Brown is a Stanford University scientist. He asked himself a very powerful question. And increasingly, that's a big feature of our work with clients is what's the powerful driving question that your business needs to answer? And his personal question was, how can I have the biggest impact on climate change? And his answer was to re-engineer the food system, in particular to get rid of meat. And so he uses all of his PhDs <laughs> to figure out how to create the taste and texture of meat using plants. And it comes down to a particular a substance called heme, H-E-E-M. Yes. So if you Google yes. Challenger Brands to Watch 2017, you'll find my profile of, of Impossible Foods and Pat and the work that he's trying to do. What I love about this is he's not prepared to just kind of have this be a little Silicon Valley, San Francisco, Bay Area restaurant menu item. He wants to go right into the heart of America. So he's just created a partnership with White Castle Burgers, <laughs> which, what was, the, I can't, I was trying to remember actually, I was thinking about this. It, they were in, a, it was like some stone. Oh place. yeah. Uh, you know the one I mean? Kumar and something. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, I know. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Yes. So you know, it's that's the heart of American burger culture, and Pat has done a. They've created a, an alliance <laughs> partnership where they're going to distribute the Impossible Slider, the Impossible Burger, through White Castle. So he's going right at the heart of it. So I, I just think you know he embodies that kind of belief driven challenger brand mentality. I was just going to add, I, I do remember this and it's the heme for those other people that are listening that make it a vegetable, if you will, veggie burger bleed. Yeah, exactly. It gives you the meat 
effect, right? And the browning and the juice and all the other stuff. So, And it's slightly challenging. You know, if I'm not a vegetarian, I, so I do eat meat occasionally, but there's something a little weird about it right. when you bite into it and it kind of bleeds and you know it's not meat. Right. So there's that. There is a kind of odd hmm, <laughs> factor that he has to get over. And I think he's just at the very, very beginning of his journey of figuring out how to tell that story to a middle American customer that probably doesn't want to hear it, frankly. So I'm watching him. I just did a project actually with Twitch. You familiar with Twitch? Yes. Right. Yep. Are you a gamer? I'm not. I'm not. But the idea of watching other gamers is just mind boggling me. But I will say, and I'm not sure if this is good or bad, but my 10 year old daughter loves Minecraft and will spend an hour watching someone else play Minecraft on YouTube. So it's a thing. It's a thing. And it's, yeah. it's much more of a thing than you think it is. Right. If you're like me and you're on the outside of it and you come to it and you, it's like discovering a whole new world right. where it just operates by its own rules. And I'll say to people, yes, yeah, basically, you know, people sit and watch other people play video games. They go, that's ridiculous. And I go, oh, so how many hours did you spend at the weekend watching grown men throw pigskin around? Right. It's fundamentally not that much different, except the difference is when you're you're interacting with the star. It's like you can actually talk to LeBron during the play and LeBron can give you feedback on what you've just said and other people there can. So the distinction between audience and creator is blending. So everybody's there creating that experience together. And it's fascinating to listen, to hear people talk about what it is they go for. And I won't say anything else about that because it might <laughs> contravene some waiver I've signed somewhere, some legal document. <laughs> but it's fascinating to me and it's fundamental. It shifted the way I think about entertainment and the way entertainment is going to evolve in the next 10 years dramatically because it'll be much more open and participatory and collaborative than it currently is. And that's going to change everything. So I'm really interested in Twitch and watching that. And then the, the third one is American Giant. So oh, you, yeah. you yeah. may have seen this as the best hoodie ever made. Yeah. Again, it's, it's a challenger interview. It's a challenger brand to watch, I think, a couple of years ago by the CEO. There's a guy called Bayard Winthrop, which makes him sound like one of those guys out of trading places, but he's <laughs> the old guys. He's not. He's a very cool, hip, modern guy. And he hired an Apple designer to design a great sweatshirt. It's a $90 sweatshirt, so it's not for everybody. But his real mission that he doesn't necessarily lead with, but it's absolutely critical to animate him and his team's motivations to win in the marketplace is to bring back the American manufacturing business and the American cotton industry. So saved a bunch of factories and cotton farmers out there. Actually, in your neck of the woods, I think. Yeah, I think one of their main production facilities is in North Carolina. Yeah. yeah. So I'm just really fascinated by how he's going to figure out how to build his brand in a world of Amazon and in a world of $15 hoodies from, I don't know, you name it, kind right. of sweatshop driven business. And it's, it's fascinating to watch. And I'm, you know, I'm root these are three businesses that I'm rooting for. That sounds great. Sounds great. Well, last question for you, but it's a doozy is what do you think the future of marketing holds? <laughs> <laughs> Damn you, Alan. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you know, I tell you what, okay, just plucking something from the air, but I, I think is really interesting is what is the future of brand building in a world of Amazon? Mm. You know, this is something that, is it Scott Galloway? Do you know Scott Galloway? Professor Scott Galloway? Yes, yes. NYU, I think, right? Yeah, yeah he'd be great to get on your podcast because he's the guy that says, look, in a world where I'm standing in my kitchen and I've run out of batteries, I'm just going to yell at Alexa, send me 12 double A's. <laughs> What's Alexa going to do? It's going to send the Amazon batteries. Right. What is Energizer and or Duracell going to do when it's been disintermediated like that? Right. And it just tees up this idea that in a world where data is the new oil, if you don't have the data and you're being disintermediated, whether it's by a retailer or Amazon, I guess is a retailer, but you know, how do you build a brand? How do you maintain any relationship with the customer? And it really puts a premium on the kind of thinking that we've been talking about, the fame building, fame generating initiatives that you're going to have to do to build your brand in the culture so that you actually have a point of view about why you want the Energize and or the Duracell battery versus the Amazon one, which again, and then, you know, in that world, it's a commodity business. Do I really care about a Duracell? Is it really genuinely different? 
I mean, this is something that Tillamook has established. You can build a brand in a commodity space built on small but notable differences in product performance, but you've got to do much more than that. You know, so I guess in a world where Amazon is going to become only more and more dominant, brands have to embrace the fact that they're going to have to figure out ways to navigate around that as well as be baked into that system. And when you navigate around it, it's about building direct relationships with consumers that sometimes you can monetize directly by building your own direct consumer business. And sometimes it's just building the relationships so that when they go to Amazon, they might be inclined to click on you versus the whatever Amazon generic they're offered. No, that's great advice. And I know many, 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 many consumer companies that are frightened by what Amazon could do to their business. So it's definitely something to be conscious of going forward. But I want to say thank you so much for spending time with me. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Marketing Today is brought to you by Atomic. Atomic focuses on unleashing the growth potential for clients we serve. Atomic is a strategic consultancy specializing in business, marketing, brand, and innovation. Our singular goal is to help you accelerate your efforts with the right mix of expertise, analysis, and creativity. Check us out at atomic.com. A-T-O-M-C-K dot com. Hi, it's Alan again. Marketing Today was created and produced by me with writing and editing by Kevin Greeley. Social media support by Megan Woods. Art and graphic design by Sarah Dell. If you're new to marketing today, please feel free to write us a review on iTunes or your favorite listening platform. Don't forget to subscribe and tell your friends and colleagues about the show. I love to hear from listeners. and You can contact me at marketingtodaypodcast.com. There you'll also find complete show notes with links to anything we talk about on any episode. You can also search our archives. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today.